the more practice that you get, the more times that you experience something, the faster you'll get at like recovering and the better you are understanding what works for you and your body. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we talk about exploring and finding your career path, cultural identity, and wellness practices that work for you. Our guest today is Janet Wang. Janet is a co-founder and co-host of Asian Boss Girl, a podcast turned small media company for the modern day Asian American women. They've been on air since 2017, sharing stories about their corporate journeys, cultural identity, dating stories, stories, and more. She also hosts a mini show under the Asian Boss Girl umbrella called Living Well with Janet, where she explores health and wellness trends as a Western person with Eastern upbringing. Hi, Janet. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Hi, Eileen. I am very excited to be here. I've been a long time fan, uh, watching all of your content and also listening to your podcast. And I know Helen and Mel, my close friends on our podcast are also fans. So super excited to be here with you today. (laughs) Yay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm fans of you guys as well. Like I can't believe it's taken this long to actually get to speak with you. (laughs) I know. We're both in LA too, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Um, why don't you start by telling us your story and a little bit about the story of how and why you guys started Asian Boss Girl? Yeah, sure. Um, so this was back in 2017, uh, when Mel, Helen, and myself, so my other two girls on the podcast called Asian Boss Girl, um, started, uh, basically a passion project. And how it came about was that a lot of our friends socially, um, worked in the content creation space. And we would go out, we'd hang out, um, or like have meals together. And the three of us were really like kind of the only people who were working in more like corporate environments. Uh, Helen was, you know, she had a 10 year career in finance. Um, I was a user experience designer in technology. And prior to that had worked also in a couple of different like. Um, corporate type uh, roles. And Mel was uh, doing social media, but in kind of like a, a fast fashion company. And so, um, you know, our friends were like, you know, if you guys are interested in creating content or kind of having fun, like the conversations that you have after work about about your gripes, you know, of being in the office or like, oh my gosh, like how is like dating in LA and the challenges around that? Um, They're like, people would be really engaged with this. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, cool. Yeah, that's fun. You know, like we're hanging out with people that create content. This should be easy. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It took us so many months from concept to actually being able to publish an episode. And, um, you know, what started as kind of just like a bit of a, yeah, let's try this out, turned into a realization of how challenging the content creation (laughs) process is and really helped us gain a massive amount of respect for anyone out there doing this type of work. Um, But specifically within podcasting, that was a brand new field for us. And at the time in 2017, there were not very many podcasts out there. And so, um, you know, we just went on air and kind of shared what we know as three Asian American working women, um, and started to develop an audience and a following, a community essentially of other women who related to our content. Um, you know, a lot of our listeners are between the ages of 25 to 35. They work in, um, either they're going to school or graduate degrees or, you know, working in offices. Um, and like us, you know, their parents are immigrants or, um, you know, they know, they, they struggle with some of the same experiences that we've had with being able to balance two different cultures. Um, so that's a lot of what we share on our podcast, everything from developing your career to dating stories to a lot of cultural um, reflections and even like conversations with our parents. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know if I've actually even said the name yet, Asian Boss Girl. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> but the, um, yeah, and that's that's kind of how it developed and you know, we did it part-time while we were working our full-time jobs for about two to three years. And only in the last two or three years, we went full-time and have really tried to expand and going into YouTube, doing a lot of brand partnerships, um, a lot of events that we're hosting. We just did a brunch with, um, you know, with a couple of, a couple of our listeners in the Orange County area. So we're just really trying to, what started as a passion project and turn it into not only a thriving business, but um, a community for our listeners and for the other Asian boss girls out there. 
Yeah. I love your story. And I think what makes your podcast really resonate with people is like how genuine it is because you're truly friends and it really is relatable. Like you were living that life, the corporate life, and you had so many things to talk about that like a lot of people can relate to that. So I think it's really nice. And it's it's also cool to like see you guys transition into making it full time and making it like a full media brand and everything. Um, tell us about your personal journey. Like a little bit about, you know, your background. What was the taking that leap like? How did you know it was the right thing to do and what was guiding you? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for those kind words. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely, we, uh, it's kind of a strange, we always say it's, it was a bit of like fate or kind of the universe bringing us together um, in having, a, you know, developing friendship that actually, I feel like if we had known each other really, really well, the podcast might not have been a, or the way that we shared our stories, it was like our friendship deepened during the podcast. So we had just met and we're at the right point in our friendship where we were comfortable, we knew each other, but we didn't know each other's like deep, deep backstories. And I think that's where the conversations that we dug into were very authentic because oftentimes what we were sharing on the mic was like the first time we were hearing things. All right, before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Ghostbed. We all have different ideas about what personal growth can look like, but nobody will deny the foundation of a healthy, abundant lifestyle is getting quality sleep. If you've been tossing and turning a lot lately, it may be time to invest in your well-being with a new mattress. My friends at Ghostbed make beautiful, high-quality mattresses that ensure you get a supportive night of rest. Ghostbed is a family-run business that's been making mattresses for over 20 years, and they put love and care, along with super high-quality materials, into every mattress they make. The best part is their signature and patented cooling materials in each bed, so you can get a comfortable night of sleep even during the hottest parts of summer. Ghostbed has a friendly team of sleep experts who can guide you through choosing your perfect mattress, and they offer free shipping and free returns so you can feel comfortable trying out the bed in your home. Head to ghostbed.com now to find your perfect fit mattress. For a limited time, you can use the code TLL for 40% off your purchase site-wide. That's ghostbed.com using the code TLL. So it's, it really is like listening into people becoming, like having friendly, like conversations as mm -hmm. a friend for the first yeah. time. That's so interesting. Yeah, exactly. But for me personally, I, I guess like the perspective that I brought um, in initially when we were kind of having these conversations on the podcast was someone who is uh, Chinese American. My parents came from Taiwan and they were here, they came over in their like 20s, 30s for school. Um, and then I was born here and very much raised in a family, a household that had um, Chinese American ideals, but you know, from parents who came over kind of pursuing their American dream. And so they really tried to instill in me this like kind of, I think they tried to assimilate more to Western ways of thinking where you should do whatever you want and follow your dreams. And, you know, you have like one life to live kind of thing. Um, however, you know, I also grew up around my grandparents and there was kind of a lot more of that traditional, um, I think Chinese way of thinking where the definition of success is like, you know, going to a good school, you must get good grades and you become like one of three professions, right? Doctor, lawyer, <laughs> third one sometimes I've heard is like engineer or something like that. And, uh, and my dad was an engineer in fact. So I think coming, growing up in that environment, I felt like, I guess like I kind of followed by the rules all the way up until maybe after college. And I'd worked so hard to get good grades, get into good school and land a good job. Um, and when I got to that job, I remember sitting down and sitting down in my cubicle, <laughs> looking at the wall and within that second day thinking, oh my gosh, is this what I worked so hard for? Like, is this it? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I just felt this like sinking feeling in my stomach where I kind of knew like, this is, this is not for me and I don't think I can stay here. Um, and at the time I didn't really have a lot of mentors or other people that I was close with to kind of guide me through my career. And so I kind of just freaked out and was like, this is not for me. Now I'm trying to figure out, you know, a way to get out. And thus kind of began a pretty tumultuous shifting of different careers that I feel like my parents are very supportive of. Um, but at the same time, it was probably very challenging for them to watch me go through as, you know, Chinese American parents. Are like, like how many different careers did you go through? 
I think formally it was like three different careers that I've had, but within those, between the three careers, there were two periods where I did kind of like volunteer um, or like I went to, I went back to school for a little bit. Um, So the first kind of thing that I did after I quit my job at Deloitte, which is where I was working after studying math and econ, uh, it was kind of like a natural transition right out of college. And um, I was really passionate about doing something more around like benefiting society and had uh, minored in international studies. And I was based in San Francisco. So I was kind of like consult marketing consulting for this like um, uh, event company that focused on social entrepreneurship. So I got really into that space, but after a while realized that, you know, to be able to make a living doing that as like a a new person who, you know, a lot of people in the industry are like, they're retired. They've made their money and they can do that. (laughs) You know, what's funny. I was actually looking into that industry too, right after college. I was like, oh, I want to do good. And like, so social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, I was like also interested in that. Yeah. It's fascinating, (laughs) right? And I remember learning about it in international studies where I'm like, oh, this is so cool where you can take something that feels like a rigid way of problem solving, which is like business strategy and Mm -hmm. apply it to social problems. I just, I found that to be like, I think intellectually very interesting. And then um, when I was in San Francisco, it was around all those people that shared that type of like passion and, and curiosity, but I just couldn't really find like a role that felt sustainable for me financially. And so then I, you know, my kind of first or I guess then like my pivot back into what I felt was more of a corporate setting uh, was brand strategy and advertising. And so I actually did a boot camp program and went to Miami for three months and uh, built a portfolio. And then I went off to New York and I thought, okay, now I'm going to like really go for this like New York lifestyle and like work in advertising. And as I was even just like wrapping up the program and interviewing, I could feel inside of me that like it didn't, it started to feel kind of like Deloitte. Like there were aspects of the um, competitiveness or the priorities that people seem to put or to have in place that didn't quite jive with me. And, you know, I think without anyone really to talk to and guide me through, um, like as a mentor, I felt really out of place. Because a lot of the people that were in that program and going into advertising were coming from like more of like an art background or um, marketing already or advertising. And I was coming from this like very rigid, like tax economic consulting background. Um, And so I just, it was a very hard shift for me. And um, I ended up still working in advertising for about a year. But after that point, as I anticipated, you know, burned out. (laughs) Uh, And then once again, kind of returned to this, okay, wanting to help people, wanting Mm -hmm. to, to do good. And it started more at that point internally for myself. I think after going through two rounds of careers that were very challenging and to me did not feel like a right fit. I had experienced like just a lot of personal unhappiness that, you know, radiated through like physical, mental, emotional. And so I became really um, interested in Eastern ways of uh, preserving my health. And a lot of that comes from my mom. Um, you know, I uh, was raised Chinese American. And even though we grew up in a Western world, we had Western doctors. She very much lives by the Eastern way of thinking when it comes to health, which is about preservation and prevention and about using food as your you know biggest source of medicine, the importance of balance and sleep and exercise um, and all of that. And so kind of prompted by a bit of interest from her and just personal experiences, I decided that I wanted to go to Chinese medicine school. (laughs) (laughs) So I spent a quarter there. And then once again, kind of had this realization of like, I love what I'm studying, but I don't know if I can really practice this and I can really be in school for like four years. And, um, and it was a really hard thing for me to leave. I think at that point I was still in the mindset that I'm looking for this one perfect career. And each time I had changed, I felt like I had failed. And so here I was again, I'm like, I've told all my friends that I'm doing this, you know, like I've moved, you know, like I've rented out like a small apartment in LA, but I kind of knew in my gut, like if I force myself to do this, like, sure, I can make it work, but it's maybe like, it just didn't feel like the right, right thing. And so I made another shift and went back into what I thought would be a more corporate setting. Um, and I probably should should emphasize that a lot of that fear came from like financial security. Uh, I think once I realized the reality of, um, you know, working as a Chinese medical practitioner in the U.S., you're oftentimes practicing acupuncture. And 
uh, when you graduate, most of the time you're like starting your own practice or you intern at like a hospital or something like that. And even though I had talked to uh, people who practice that, I think I had gone in with all this confidence that I can do it. You know, it's fine if I have to start my own practice or I'll find like an internship. But once I started studying and and being there and doing that, I was like, oh man, four years of no income. And then once you start work, earning income, it can be very slow. So kind of motivated by financial stability, I went and did another boot camp um, in user experience design, which is kind of related a bit to like strategy, uh, but a little bit more creative um, and started working in technology. And that was where I think just maybe just the place I was in my life and what I had learned up until that point felt to me like finally I'd found a career that was a good fit. And a lot of it was also me taking the pressure off of my career needing to be my full identity. And it was when I kind of stopped looking for the perfect job and in my mind like settled, but very happily, and then started to say, I'm going to seek these other things and other in my friendships in, in projects and things like that, that then you know, then I suddenly found myself doing Asian Boss Girl and then it took off. And then suddenly we found ourselves in a position where there was the opportunity to go full time because we were having to turn down like speaking requests and and things like that just because we were at work during the day. So multiple leaps of faith. Uh, and I'm sorry, that's a very long-winded no, answer. No, it's okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I think it's nice for you to lay out the story that way because it really shows people how many times you had to take a leap to try something new and then it just be honest with yourself, oh, this is not working and then try something new. It takes courage each time. And I can relate to you too, because I've done so many internships where I thought that's what I wanted to do, but then you have that gut feeling like, oh, this is not right. And it's hard to, especially after you've told all your friends and family, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be this, <laughs> so, you know, this is who I am now. And then like yeah. a, a year later, you're like, actually, never mind. Like exactly. it's hard. <laughs> it, it is tr- your, your identity is like always shifting and it's hard. It, that's like a own thing to deal with. So yeah, thank you for sharing that because I think it can reassure a lot of people listening who might be still lost and still figuring out their path. Um, yeah, and so with Asian Boss Girl, did it feel right? Like, was it? Did it feel different this time? I think it definitely did, but not not maybe in the way that people would think. Uh, I think there's. The job itself on paper and objectively, I would say it's a fit because it feels personal. Unlike any of my other jobs um, where I enjoyed the work, maybe I enjoyed the environment, maybe I felt like uh, intellectually challenged. But what we do is um, I feel like sharing something very personal, which is my personal experiences, and then having other people directly express to me some impact from that. Mm -hmm. And that to me is kind of a different level of of purpose, I suppose. Um, and the ability to build something with very, you know, good friends of mine, um, sounds like it would be a dream and it is, but it's also not the easiest. Uh, we, when you have so much freedom to do whatever, it can sometimes be a bit daunting. And especially if you are very ambitious, it can be very easy to get down on yourself or to question if you're doing enough, if you're doing the right thing. But I would say, by and large, objectively, it has been the best fit. But the other reason why it is, is because I think I have changed. And what I look for in my work and um, in how I am with with uh, society and my identity and all that, I think that has like stabilized a lot. Uh, so for anyone out there who is shifting a lot, I... I I can see, like, I feel like my younger self would be listening and, <laughs> and trying to look for answers. And I think just have faith that even if you did nothing, or even if you make the wrong decision, given like 10 years from now, I guarantee you, you'll feel like more comfortable in your skin. You'll feel more comfortable about the decisions that you've made. You'll feel more comfortable in wherever you end up. Um, and I think that's the, um, that's the thing is a lot of it is about perspective. Yeah. And it's not like you weren't supposed to make those decisions. Like it was not wrong because you learned each time that you make that sort of decision, right? So it all comes back. It all adds to what you have and what you've learned. Yeah. And I will say like in a practical sense at Asian Bosco for what we do, um, like 
Mel brings her social media background. So I, I you know, from a business perspective, she's able to do that quite well. And uh, from Helen's perspective, she had a 10-year career in fin- finance. So she brings that perspective. I think for me, because I've had such a blended background, you know, at times I feel like still a little insecure about that. But then I think about how much that it's has benefited gift. me. Yeah, yeah, it's a strength. Yeah. I think within the three of us, I like I don't have like one particular like skill set that I bring, but I will usually be the person that like starts something or figures tinkers on the website or like tinkers on figuring out how to like set up the podcast, learn to write copy a little bit. I think the things that I've done have given me a good base level to be able to then contribute to what we do in some fashion. What's your favorite part about writing Asian Boss Girl? Oh my gosh, it's at it is absolutely our listeners and getting to um, meet them and to talk with them, uh, and oftentimes just to hear their stories, you know, because it's always you know when you have a podcast and you're sharing your personal life, people know like everything about you, and when you meet them, you know nothing about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like they already know who you are. They know yeah, your deepest, yeah. darkest secrets, everything. Exactly. Yeah. So even meeting with them, sometimes I'm like, well, it's not like I can be like, hey, what's up? Like, you know what's up in my life, but like, yeah. let me know what's up in your life. Um, and, and that's definitely ultimately like my favorite part of it for sure. Let's talk about your identity because you mentioned how your identity is more solid now. So I mean identity as in like your career, but also like Chinese American, I guess whatever you want it to mean, right? So how did you relate to your identity before? And then how do you like define it now? How has anything changed? Oh my gosh. And what yeah, has changed? Immensely. Yeah. Let's immensely. talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Mission Viejo, California, which is located in Orange County. And um, Orange County definitely has like pockets of like Asian enclaves or, you know, communities of a lot of like Asian people. But uh, where I grew up and where I went to school, it was not one of them. And so uh, from a very young age, I was always used to feeling like a minority. And my parents, uh, you know, they they did a lot to like foster relationships with other like Asian American uh, families. And, and I had friends who were, who had immigrant parents, but maybe were not necessarily Asian, but I didn't have like a very, very strong community around me. And so I kind of was always used to the idea of feeling a bit different. But we did have cousins that lived in the 626 area in LA uh, where there is this huge Asian enclave. And when they went to school, everyone was, you know, more or less like them, like Asian American. Their parents immigrated here either from China or Taiwan. And so on weekends, we would go out there to have like meals with them. And I found myself in this weird situation where on the weekdays, I didn't fit in with, you know, I wasn't like white enough. And then on the weekends, I would go and hang out with my cousins who were very immersed in Asian American culture. And I was like not Asian American enough. So I kind of almost just got used to always feeling a little bit different. And it wasn't until I went to college, I went to UCSD. And for anyone who attends a UC university, you know that it has a very high population of Asian American people. And that was the first time that I felt that I had a a group of people around me who were like me and I was living with them day to day. Like I remember walking into my dorm room and seeing the name tags of each of my nine suite mates and thinking, oh, I'm at college. It's going to be like a whole bunch of different types of people. Every last name was Asian. And Mm -hmm. there was a part of me that was like taken aback, like, whoa. Um, But then as I got to know them, even though we were all, you know, on the surface, the same as like Asian American, they were all so different. You know, some were Korean American. Um, some came from like Hong Kong. One girl was adopted um, by a white family. So mm-hmm. even though on the surface we had, I think, you know, objectively, if you check the box, like we would look the same, our background or experience was so different. But I think there is still that binding, the cultural similarities that for me was the first time I was around other people who, who got that. Um, and from that point, I think that was one of my biggest turning points. Um, but then of course, after graduating from college, I kind of went back out into the workforce and kind of didn't do much thinking or I guess like involvement around anything dealing with my culture. I kind of was so focused on establishing my identity based on just my career. And it wasn't until moving back to, um, California or like Southern California being Los Angeles and reconnecting, um, with, uh, friends. And it's a little strange. So Helen's husband, I actually went to college with him 
And it was there, and I kind of maybe left out that when I was in college, not only was it the first time I was around all these people, but I joined like a dance team that was a part of the Chinese oh, Student Association. Oh my gosh. I was on the dance team at USC. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep, yeah. Yep. Right. It's an entire yep. community of people. Mm-hmm. And when I think back now, a lot of the uh, friendships I've maintained from college came from um, people from those organizations that you know we, we uh, identified with each other through our cultural similarities. And so when I came back to LA, I reconnected with her um, her husband and their group of friends, and then met Helen and Mel. Um, and uh, you know, they her husband was like very established in the content creation in the Asian American content creation space. And I think really finding my group of people in LA in that way started to reinvigorate in me and make me question and be exposed to a lot of these issues, be exposed to a lot of these like ways of thinking and the questions and reevaluate my relationship with my culture and what that meant for my identity. And then especially doing Asian boss girl, um, you know, we're essentially, whenever we do those culture episodes, it's like, I have to sit back and, you know, talk to my parents. I have to sit back and think about how, how my upbringing or how my culture has impacted me. So in many ways, it's been such a, it's been such an adventure and there've been periods in my life where I feel a lot more in touch with my culture and that it's a bigger part of my identity. And there were periods where it was a little bit lower. Um, and I think Asian boss girl has been probably a big turning point for me where now moving forward, as I think about wanting to like grow a family and and everything, like that is something I want to be able to pass on to my children um, and to have them uh, immersed in the community of other Asian American people. Yeah, I, I think you have a unique experience because because of your podcast, you're able to like talk about your culture identity so often, and you're able to like break it down, analyze, and explore it on a deeper level than most people would, right? So what what have you learned and how has your perspective changed over the years? Oh, that's a really good question. What have I learned so much? But then it's like, if I had to identify one thing. Like whatever comes to mind, the biggest thing. I guess I have like, it's a bit of a two-parter. One is that your connection to your culture does require deliberate effort. I think sometimes we always just think like whatever you're, you are genetically, um, you know, is like, there's not, I don't have to put any effort into that. I just am that. Right. But, uh, to truly, truly feel connected to any part of your identity, you have to put in some sort of practice and put in like habits. And that is something that I think I do regularly now by default because of the work that I do. But I would say for any listeners out there who are trying to work through like their understanding of their culture and and it, how it plays into their identity to do the extra work of or, I mean I don't like to call it work but you know take on the advantage of being able to have conversations with family um, seek out other people of your culture um, seek out other foods similar in your culture immerse yourself in that in any way I mean join a book club maybe where it's like sharing stories about the history of the countries where your parents and your grandparents came from so. If there was one tip, it's like it. I think it's like it requires deliberate effort. And the second is that your relationship with your culture will be constantly changing, and that's okay. Like I think the idea, like there's this term where people say like I'm a bad Asian <laughs> or I'm like bad Asian American, and you know I used to feel that way a lot, like a lot of shame. It's like I'm I don't know the language well enough or don't know this enough. And honestly, there I think that's okay. Like everyone's relationship with their culture is different and it's going to ebb and flow. It's okay to be a bad Asian sometimes and it's okay to be a good Asian sometimes. So yeah, I think a like lot there shouldn't be just, a definition of what's good and bad. It's just everyone's right. relationship is different, right? Exactly. And it's all exactly. okay. And it's all okay. Yeah. Let's take a break for our sponsor. The show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Have you ever stopped to think about how much time you give to yourself compared to the time you give to others? It's easy to get caught up in meeting everyone else's needs, but neglecting your own can lead to overwhelm and burnout. Therapy can give you an outlet to express yourself, your needs, and find more balance in your life. 
For me, therapy has helped me realize my unhealthy patterns with the pressure I put on myself to meet my own expectations. It helped me reframe my beliefs and negative habits. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. Okay, let's talk about your journey into wellness because I know you're super into wellness and you did mention you studied Chinese medicine for a little bit. So tell us about that story. Like, why are you passionate about wellness? So I had kind of shared a bit about my career background. I think a lot of that is what, um, what my story is wrapped around. I spent so much of my young adulthood um, so focused on schoolwork and on my career that I often put a lot of things second, um, most notably like my physical health and my the health of my relationships. I was just so unilaterally focused on the work that I was doing and on performing um, and in a really imbalanced way. And I think for me, it was like realizing that I was hitting points of burnout every couple of years And that that wasn't normal. Um, And everyone's definition of burnout is different. For me, it was a little bit of like realizing I was jumping careers a lot. And one, I think it's okay to do that and to explore. But when I really dug deep into like, why was I making those changes? There were a number of reasons. Um, Not to say they're right or wrong, but I think one of them might be like feeling a sense of burnout. In hindsight, had I maybe... I don't know, put in some better uh, wellness practices during some of those periods, would I have stayed? Would I have found happiness there? Potentially. I can never say, right? But I think it was this realization um, each time that I like hit a point of burnout where I'm like, okay, something needs to change. And uh, I always found that it was kind of like my mom's voice in the back of my head, (laughs) always saying, are you sleeping enough? Are you exercising? And um, finally learning that when I did put those very basic things into place, like it's like really, it goes down to the the primary, primary basics of just living as a human being. It's what you eat, how you sleep, how your digestion system is working. Um, If those things are solid, it's like you are so much better equipped to be able to do anything else. And so it was a little bit of just like trial and error on my own life circumstances of, of hitting burnout and being able to feel like each time I got a little bit better because I focused on my exercise, because I focused on my sleep and I'm not the best sleeper. And I also was not always the most like physically active person. So it took a lot of trying different things and, you know, learning certain things that don't work for you and then trying other things that really helped me develop this interest in, um, in food and exercise. And then that helped that like folded into another layer when I started getting into yoga and meditation and for me, in the last couple of years, after after feeling like I had started developing a pretty good um, practice with like exercise and with food, and I've also gone through you know a journey of like trying vegetarian diets and trying like um, uh, like raw unintentionally raw diet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you know hearing from my mom, who's you know in Chinese culture, you should it's always about eating cooked foods. So raw is you know like supposed to be like really bad for you. And then going back and trying that, incorporating fish. And I always say every body is different. Um, but I think I think it was probably a lot of the the Chinese mom influence of using those tools, using the wellness tools to solve the problems that I was facing in my life, like turning to those as the things that I should fix versus trying to get that better job or trying to move to the other city. And uh, yeah, and then once I got, I feel like my food and my exercise down, I think meditation was kind of the next thing that I had on my to-do list for like many years. And I knew that it was good and, you know, I had heard all about the benefits, but I always found it kind of a hard thing to get into. And then um, as I, as I got into it, it just became something that I found was like an extra level of feeling well Um, and so that's been kind of the most recent evolution of my, of my journey. (laughs) Nice. And do you feel like, do you still experience those like burnout cycles or do you feel like you found more balance because of all these wellness practices? Yeah, I definitely feel like I am better about catching myself before I will go into a burnout cycle. Um, is it perfect? Definitely not. (laughs) (laughs) I think I, I definitely still 
have a, have a tendency to push myself. Um, yeah. sometimes a little overboard. I'm still trying to figure out where those boundaries are, but I'm definitely a lot better about it. And I feel like when I do hit burnout, my recovery time is much faster because I I've learned the tools that work for me. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I, I think that it's just, it's kind of like anything else, the more that you, the more practice that you get, the more times that you experience something, the faster you'll get at like recovering and the better you are understanding what works for you and your body. Yeah. I asked that because I I can relate to you too. Like I'm the type that will push myself and want to do more. And then I find myself burning out and then it happens. And then I, you know, takes a break and then I have more energy to go again. And so it is it's a pattern that I notice repeating. And I know a lot of people who are achievers can relate like people listening. So what tips do you have for people to prevent and deal with burnout? That is a great one. I was actually just thinking about this the other day. Um, I realized like I have a tendency to just like push myself to what I might think is a, or like what might be actually a hundred in my capacity, but I think is like only 80%, right? Like I'm like, oh, I went like, um, the other day we had like that brunch event for Asian Boss Girl. And then I came home and, uh, I didn't really do very much. And the next day I ended up sleeping in so much. And I went to my boyfriend. I was like, why am I so tired? And he's like, well, you did have this event yesterday. I was like, yeah, but after the event, I was feeling so good. And like, I didn't feel like, you know, like, uh, uh, drained at all. And he's like, okay, well, maybe you don't feel it initially, but it definitely is impacting you. And I share that because I think for me, that is like understanding that you like making an effort to try to push myself only to like my 70% and making that my like new hundred percent, if that makes Mm. sense. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, because knowing that you always overshoot it, you're like, okay, let's try to to (laughs) pull back a little bit. Pull back a little bit. Yeah. It makes (laughs) me think of, I think there's like this like Japanese saying that you always only eat to 80% fullness because Mm -hmm. the, um, I think my mom says that she tells me that (laughs) she's like, it's healthy to eat to 70 to 80%. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And I think biologically how that works is that your brain, um, doesn't process the fullness or like there's a bit of lag time. And that's kind of how I feel like sometimes like when it comes to my energy, when it comes to my energy, I'm like, okay, like if I'm still standing, that means I'm good. (laughs) But no, it means that you're going to pay for it later. Yeah. Yeah. It's also like when you're in the zone or maybe you're like when you're already going, there's momentum. So you just keep going, but you don't realize that you've already passed that mark. (laughs) It's like, it is like the eating. Like when someone, something tastes so good, you just keep eating it, even though you're like not hungry anymore. (laughs) Exactly. And then, and then like 30 minutes later, you have a stomach ache and you're like, then you realize, oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, Yeah. So I, I think for me, I'm, I'm not, I'm still rusty at that and not the best at that, but, um, I'm trying to put that in practice. And I think if you're mm -hmm. also an overachieving type, it's really hard to put that in practice because you almost feel guilty for not doing enough. But I just try to focus on, okay, like knowing that me spending another like hour doing this is actually going to be me losing an hour like the next time. So if you start to really understand that it, it, there is a direct productivity like payoff to that. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Okay, so tell us about your, you know, your health like routines or habits. What are the things that you absolutely try to be consistent with and try to do? This is a great question because I think um, a lot of people when they think of wellness, they think that there are like you know, it means that you are like perfect and doing everything um, all the time and for, you know, super long periods of time. I think that the reality of life and the reality of humans is that we're always changing and what meant, what was well for you like last week may not be well for you this week. Um, So for me, I try to be flexible, but have like certain, like I know the things that work for me, but I'm not putting all of them into practice perfectly every day, every week. But the things that I do when I'm having like a good week, uh, generally it's meditating in the morning and then meditating, uh, in the evening. And I'll do 30 minutes of in the beginning and then 30 minutes, um, after. And that is, I try to really keep consistent with that. And has it been perfect? No, there are days where I skip, but more uh, often than not, I will, I will get that in. Um, and then I take a vitamin, <laughs> I take a multivitamin. I've, ex- yeah. I've been experimenting with different types that I always, I, I very much value nutrition. And as much as I like to prioritize whole foods, sometimes it's not happening, you know, especially if you're like traveling or schedules are changing. Um, so I really prioritize getting the vitamin at least. 
And then um, making sure that, you know, of my meals that at least like one of them has got a bunch of like good, healthy vegetables. <laughs> um, and that's like, that's like a really big thing for me is just keeping consistent with meditation, um, keeping consistent with nutrition. And then I will say generally when I'm in a better, better like period, um, exercise through, through yoga um, and, uh, and sleep. But those two, I, I think are sometimes uh, a little inconsistent for me. Yeah. I mean, it's understandable. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> like it's always changing, but it's good to know like what the, you know, those core things that help you. I mean, I'm impressed 30 minutes in the morning and evening of meditation is quite a lot. So how do you like, do you have tips for people who are trying to get into it? Like tips to stay consistent? Yeah, I will say um, consistency over duration. Uh, the uh, that's I think the especially with meditation, it's not really about how long you do it so much as just how frequently you do it. Um, and so, if it's just like a minute, even that is like a good habit to start putting into place. It's just the morning, you know, the minute you wake up, um, like sit up in your bed and close your eyes for about a minute and just breathe. And as simple as that, if, if like the 30 minutes or like the 20 to 30 minutes, if that feels too intimidating, start at one, then work your way up to five, then work your way up to like seven, 10. Um, it's really, when it comes to habits, I think it's about like the, cons- uh, it's the frequency of doing it that it'll yeah. start to feel like muscle memory. It's true. It's always the hardest to start. Like once you've yeah. started, you can keep going, but yeah, doing it consistently, you're building that habit to like take, you know, it, it's mindful. It's being like intentional, like, oh, okay, I'm going to sit down and meditate versus like scroll my phone. Yeah, exactly. Are there any other like wellness concepts that you're passionate about that you wish everyone knew? Ooh, wellness concepts. Like anything that has like positively impacted your life that you're like, oh my gosh, everyone should do this. Everyone should try this or know about it. Yeah. I mean, for the longest time, meditation has been my thing, my thing that I really wish if I could wish something for every person to be able to, uh, to benefit from, it would be meditation, whether, and I also believe that meditation, um, like there is kind of a more rigid traditional form of it, but really, you know, people who get into meditative states through writing or through biking, like those are all kind of similar ways of being able to get out of your head and kind of like sit with yourself. And so I would say, but maybe the more traditional form of meditation, I do find that it just, it's not about necessarily like calming someone down, but just putting things in perspective. I have found that I'm less like anxious and I'm, I'm less like reactive and it's not about being like Zen or whatever. It's, it's truly because taking time to really sit with yourself, you start to, it it puts into perspective how, how much something is not that big of a deal if that makes sense. And your ability to, to really, um, believe that and understand that increases so much when you practice, uh, sitting with yourself, um, you know, doing something that might feel uncomfortable, um, you know, often. So, yeah, this might be something that people look over, but like, can you walk us through like how you meditate? Cause I know there are different ways to meditate. There are different forms of meditation. The one that I practice is more mantra based, um, so I would say if that's something you're interested in practicing, generally what you want to do is to find a comfortable space and to make sure that you're not going to be disrupted as much as you can, because we can't control the environment completely. Um, but if you want to sit into a comfortable position and then closing your eyes, um, and then starting to breathe and focus on the breath and then to begin, um, practicing either OM, which is like one of the classic mantras and, repeat that and kind of focus on that without, and you can say it out loud if you want, but usually it's kind of silently to yourself. And the moment that you start to realize that you're not doing it anymore, that you're not repeating that, you just come back to it. And it's really, that's kind of what it is. And I've probably like fumbled around that. I haven't, (laughs) I haven't really explained or talked about meditation in a while, but, um, but I, I was thinking about this the other day and I'm like, yeah, I mean, meditation, all it really is, is like, focusing on something. And the moment you realize you stop focusing on it, refocus on it, whether that's a mantra or whether that's breathing or whether that's um, a visualization, it's uh, the benefits of meditation come from just that in that split second of drifting and then coming back and then drifting and coming back. So I think for a lot of people, they think that meditation is about clearing your mind completely um, or doing the mantra completely perfectly. And that's not like the the whole point of it is that you're going to lose it 
And in the coming back is when you're training yourself to, to recognize that there's a separation between you and what is going on in your head, you know? Okay. Next, I know you mentioned feeling like, like you have a taste of both like Eastern health trends, Western health trends. Are there times where they like conf- like conflict with each other? And I don't know, how do you kind of merge the two? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, one of the, the key ways that they do totally conflict, which I think I had mentioned um, a little earlier, is that there was this like health trend in Western culture around um, eating a variety of like super fibrous and like raw vegetables, right? Yeah, like I remember is, that. There was a whole like yeah. raw till four trend. Yeah. Like, do you know that trend? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, like, I've, I've heard of it. There was a time I've where heard... people like ate a lot of bananas. <laughs> oh my gosh. I did, do you remember this? <laughs> yes. There's someone on YouTube who like subsists the banana off, or a couple or people. Something. The banana girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Um, but uh, that directly conflicts with a lot of like Eastern approach, which is you should never eat raw food. You should almost mm. always have food cooked. And, and what is the reason? The reason, at least, and this, I might not be officially like perfectly saying this, but from what I understand, it's that it takes your body more energy to digest the, um, the, the raw vegetables. And in Chinese medicine, they have like cold versus hot food. So if it's a raw food, I think they might say that it causes too much like coldness in the body or it causes too much dampness. Um, so in Chinese culture, you always like at least like, um, you know, uh, very, it doesn't have to be like overly cooked, but at least it's like, it's, it's heated up. (laughs) And so I remember there was a direct conflict in that where, you know, I'm like, um, making a big salad and my mom's like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is healthy. She's like, no, that's absolutely the opposite of healthy. You need to be like, you know, cooking, cooking, um, eating the cooked vegetables or cooked foods. Um, and the way that I've learned to remedy that is, um, it's kind of basically incorporating a little bit of both. And experimenting with both and seeing how it works with my body. And in our household, because there is this kind of like clashing, um, the, what I think has been really beautiful is that we've been able to, um, you know, like my sister and I practicing and being brought up with like Western ideals kind of like challenge some of the Eastern ideals that my parents might have. And then they'll challenge us. And then my mom always encourages that it's about, um, that it's different for every person and that, you need to figure out what works for you and your particular body. So in that way, I've ex- I have gone through periods where like I ate a little bit more raw. I found personally that yes, I had a lot of energy, but I found it really challenging to sleep. <laughs> so I oh, almost feel like it was like too too much energy. Uh-huh. Um, and then and then with the vegetables or like with the, the cooked foods um, in Chinese culture, it's also. Uh, meat is a pretty big part of the diet. And so when I was not eating meat, that was something that really freaked my parents out. And as kind of a way to compromise, I started eating um, seafood again and fish. And I would uh, incorporate it just not not super frequently, but just enough so that, um, you know, it kind of like qualmed them. But that's once again where I, I kind of like took a blend approach. And I, and I did find that in my own experimentation that I did feel better or it was easier for me to feel better eating fish than a strict vegetarian diet. And part of that is just um, not necessarily to say that you can't feel completely healthy on a vegetarian diet. I think it just takes more effort. Um, And so just the way that I was leading my life and what was available to me and my family, um, you know, eating, eating seafood and incorporating that worked better for me. But it was always like, you know, I kind of try to see it as that you have two different ways of looking at something. And um, it means that you have like an extra an extra perspective, um, and an extra, and you can really oftentimes blend them or experiment and, you know, different things work for different people. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what I've learned is that there's no one right way for it. That applies to everyone. It's, and, and, and there's so much more also like, have you heard of Ayurveda? Yeah. A lot of my friends who are Indian American. Yeah. Yeah. So in Ayurveda, there's more than two, there's like multiple, I think there's three main body types. Everyone's a blend of these. And for example, like some people are naturally run cold. Like if it's, and and those people are like more anxious, it's called Vata. And so for those people that like eating salad would not be good for them, but they need to eat warm cooked foods. But then on the other hand, there are certain people that are naturally hot. Like they have a lot of fire energy. It's called pitta. And so it's the people that like to eat spicy food, you know, but uh, but it's yeah, not yeah. good for them. Yeah. Um, so those people need cooling foods like cucumbers and, and probably salads and raw stuff. You know, they need things to cool them down. And yeah. th- there's so much more to it, but it's that's an area that I would look into if, if you're interested. 
good, but it just, yeah. it just shows you that it's, you can't compare yourself to the person next to you because each body is unique. Um, yeah. but there are, there's, there is a lot we can learn, not just from like, I guess from all cultures. Right. 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 Thank you for sharing that. I love that, that breakdown. I, I have a very good friend who had, um, who is Indian, uh, Indian American. And I remember she had gone to San Francisco with her mom to do like, um, an Ayurveda reading where they, they analyzed her body type. And so I remember hearing from her, but I forgot what all of the, the different categories are. If you look online, there's like a quiz where you can find out your body type, but I'm sure th- there's a more accurate one if you find a practitioner or something, but Yeah. What are you excited about looking forward with Asian Boss Girl and the work you're doing? Like, I know you have your own spinoff podcast as well. Um, what are you working on and what are you excited about now? Oh my gosh. Yeah. For Asian Boss Girl, we just um, got through a huge hurdle and that was getting onto video. So we've been on audio on the airwaves for, you know, about six years now. Um, and moving to video was something that was like a really, a big lift. It's a big, it's a big change. I know. Um, like you can't be in your PJs and you can't yeah. be. <laughs> <laughs> I had to switch to video too last year. Oh my gosh. It just, it's different. It's, I mean, you know, it just takes more work. There's it more things to edit. There's, there's a lot more to, um, to work through and, um, a lot more individuals on our team that we're bringing on to help kind of like make that happen. Uh, and yeah, and for, you know, for the person, uh, for Mel Han and myself, we're like, we can't really be in PJs anymore, but we still, we just actually filmed an episode where we were specifically in PJs to see oh, if we can nice. like try to, try to, um, to counter that a little bit. But yeah, uh, that was definitely really exciting for us, uh, to be able to, um, start putting content back out on YouTube more regular, regularly because mm-hmm. over the pandemic, we had actually started like vlogging and making some videos, but we were finding that with um, our small team, it was just spreading us a bit too thin. And so getting our regular show that we put out once every week to be back on YouTube was like a really big goal of ours. And being able to hit that has been amazing. And the hope is is really just to obviously provide more content for our listeners and maybe reach some new listeners um, who are not on Spotify or, you know, Apple podcasts. Um, so I'm personally really excited to see how that evolves, um, and to see, to see that grow, um, because it, we've only like filmed now, like for a month. So, you know, there's still a lot of potential for how we can change things up. And, uh, we also have a bunch of like speaking events that we've been doing. And, uh, this coming weekend, I'm going to be um, flying back up to the Bay. We're going to be doing a bit of a speaking event at a company up in the Bay area. And so that gives an opportunity to connect with um, with our listeners in person, which I'm really excited about. And um, our brunch series it was the first, and we're hoping to host more of those. So uh, the events that we have coming up for this coming year are going to be, I'm very excited for those opportunities to be able to connect with our listeners. So that's, I think, on the Asian Boss Girl front, there's that. And there's a couple of other things that I can't quite talk about yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah. uh, very very, I feel very lucky and very fortunate that we get to do the work that we do. And we're hoping um, to be able to provide a lot of new ways for our listeners to connect in this coming year. Uh, And then personally, like we all started our own mini shows. And for me, wellness has been, um, I guess it's such a loaded word, right? Uh, But uh, it's uh, it's just something that I think for me personally, I've always been interested in, felt personally um, affected by and want to be able to share with people more specifically. And so having um, a small platform to be able to do that has been great. Uh, And, uh, um, you know, I share experiences that I've had personally and topics that I find interesting, but I always love being able to hear from other people, like, what is it that they, you know, what, what are things that they would consider a wellness that they want to learn about or hear about? And um, it's being able to explore that aspect, I think that I'm, I'm quite, quite excited about. Nice. Is that one weekly as well? It comes on once a week, but it'll rotate okay. between Helen and Mel and myself. So it's like once oh, every three weeks. For it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. I was like, how do you guys have time to do all these li- like it's a lot, yeah. things? And- <laughs> <laughs> what is like the big picture vision for Asian Boss Girl? Like, what are you guys, mm. I, I do you have a vision of like where you guys want to take it? Yeah. I mean, the core of what we do in our mission is to make Asian American women feel heard, seen, and connected. 
And uh, for us, that started with a podcast show um, or maybe more audio and then now is going on to a video format. Uh, we've also done a children's book, which for a lot of people oh. were like, what? That came out of nowhere. Yeah, um, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> but if you think of it, really the core of what our, our mission is, is around that core demographic of Asian American women and wanting them to feel heard, to feel seen, and to feel connected. And that comes through storytelling. And whether that story comes through earphones, you know, audio, or through what you're watching on video, or through what you're reading your kids on in a book, or maybe even what you're reading yourself in a novel, or what you're watching in the movie theaters, you know, that is for us about just being able to share our stories and the stories of other Asian American women um, in a way that allows them to connect with others like them. And so whatever format that can take, we're excited. We want to, you know, be able to do that in all the formats. It'd be great to be able to um, to have it expand even further. So that's kind of like the blue sky ultimate vision um, and uh, and how that will specifically happen. We're, we're just very um, open and excited about. Um, and one of the newer things that we, we, um, we did just sign with an agency. So we're hoping to be able to have more opportunities to, um, work with brands, um, in order to, to connect with our audience as well. Nice. Amazing. All right, Janet, if you have one final message you'd like to leave our listeners with today, what would that be? Ooh, only one message? It could be anything. It could be, <laughs> it could be anything. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. If I could leave one message, it would be that, so there's a quote that I love and it's called, this too shall pass. It's not called, it goes, (laughs) the quote goes, this too shall pass. And that's always been some, uh, I feel like it's a different way of kind of saying um, to recognize and be in the present. And it's, um, you know, positive for when you're having positive experiences to know to really savor it because it will not last forever. But also if you're going through a challenging period to know that um, it will not last forever as well. And so whatever moment you're in, you know, being, being in the present and learning to savor it for what it is, um, is something that I've always found to be very helpful. Love it. Thank you. And lastly, where can we find you online? Yes. Uh, you can find Asian Boss Girl at Asian Boss Girl. That's our handle for pretty much everything. Uh, we're on Spotify, podcast, Instagram, YouTube. Um, for myself, I am on Instagram at Janet W. That's Janet, J-A-N-E-T, and then the word double and the letter U. Uh, since my last <laughs> yep. name is Wang, it's, you know, it's, mm-hmm. that handle was definitely already taken. So, <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Janet, for sharing your story and for your tips. I, I can really relate to your story and I'm sure it'll help a lot of listeners who hear this and it it just gives us reassurance and hope that there are no mistakes your your journey is meant to happen the way it's meant to happen and yeah thank you so much oh thanks so much eileen 